Okay, first and foremost, there are some insights from a survey that was conducted. Man, this is really sensitive. No, I, I, I think Stop bad. it. Hunter, Don't that's nice. with you. All right. So this survey here, we had 62% were first-time home buyers in this survey. Near 80% of them use some kind of representation. That means the other 20% bought new construction and were unrepresented. 83.5% um, of those who used representation used a real estate agent or a broker. Um, the other 20%, again, don't know how they did it. But these are some of the results. 38.8% were represented by one agent, dual agency in the state. This is in Utah. This is it. This is in Utah. It's it's whole state, and it was. This is a survey done by. Um, oh dang it! It's the University of Utah. It's their. Um, who's the school of economics? Yeah, the the Kim Gardner Institute of Real Estate. Yeah, that's likely new construction, but generally um, builders don't re represent both sides. They have their agents only represent them. So that's, that's the unrepresented. They rarely will do um, both sides. I'm saying some builders will. Most builders will only have their agents represent the builder. Anyway, but let's keep going. First and foremost, as a reminder, dual agency is not allowed in this brokerage. Can I be more clear? If there's a question, please come talk to me. Dual agency is not allowed. You can refer it to somebody else, or my preference would be have an unrepresented buyer. If you have an agent, or excuse me, have a buyer that falls in love with one of your listings, let them know, hey, on this particular listing, because you fell in love with my listing, I need to represent the buyer, the seller. Say it nice and loud, I can't hear you. You can have an unrepresented buyer yeah so what i would do is I, if, if you already have a buyer broker with that specific buyer i would add an addendum if you fall in love with one of my listings you will be unrepresented on that particular listing is that answer your question yeah you can list their home absolutely because that's a separate transaction, but on the same transaction, I don't want you as an agent representing full fiduciary, both buyers and sellers, because you can't. Sorry, it's impossible. That's a huge room for improvement, guys. Um, in the state, again, it's legal. I just don't believe it's, it's ethical. I don't think it's right, because you can't give full fiduciary, full confidentiality to both clients. You just can't. Represent your seller on this one, okay? 56%. Um, said that trustworthiness was number one. That was the number one criterion for them. That's really funny. Um, I just think if you smile enough, they may think that you're trustworthy. And so what I encourage, and this is you know coming from here, please, please, please be trustworthy, be honest. And that's why I want you to just represent one side. 83% um, gave, you know, reps, they gave four or five ratings. So they, agents got, got good ratings. Um, high levels of satisfaction. Some believe the representation, most of them, again, 70% thought their agent was loyal to them. Only 70%? Man, you should be a diehard. You should know that you're totally their advocate. I've worked with agents in this office that they are fighting tooth and nail, keeping the transactions together. And that's really, that's what our job is. And that's why you really can't represent both sides. You have to represent your agent, your client, excuse me. Um, only about three quarters of them thought that their information was confidential. Man, loose lips sink ships. Don't, you know, don't go off that one. Nearly 70% believe their representation gave them reasonable care and due diligence. Man, I hope you guys are on the high end. You get five stars on that. That's, that's our goal. Anyway, that's all I had. I just wanted to say, look for areas that you can improve your business, be better. Because I think that's, I want us to be better. I love it when other agents come and say, Dean, I'm working with one of your agents. And I already knew before we started, it's going to be a great transaction. And that's because you guys are the best trained. And I think the best, the best agents out there, people will self-select. They'll leave because they don't like the standards that we set. And so I just really want you guys to be there, be the best.
you know, how do you say, go big or go home? Anyway, that's all I got. Awesome. Thanks, Dean. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. We've got 30 minutes to talk about eight hours worth of material. So where's the clicker at? Oh. It's the stick. Um, um, well, first, let me start with this. Uh, Mark King. Who knows who Mark King is? Like nobody. Great. Novely and Dean. Wonderful. He is actually the president of Keller Williams International. He's one of Gary's right hand guys, of course. I'm pretty sure his name is up outside one of our conference rooms right now. So know him. Uh, Inman News just asked Mark King, uh, I think it was yesterday. They, he said, what's the biggest challenge facing Keller Williams as we start 2023? What do you think he said? Anyone want to take a stab at it? What's the biggest challenge facing Keller Williams agents? Take a stab at it, Heather. Your mindset. It's probably part of it. Anyone else want to stab at it? His answer is surprisingly simple. It's kind of a yes. He said the biggest challenge facing Keller Williams in 2023 is we need to sell a damn house. That was his, that was his answer. It's mindset, right? Sure. That's why I say kind of. We've got to sell a house. Yeah, there it is. Look at that. Did you hand this out already? I didn't even mean to do that, but he's got the article. Friday's article. It's a, it's, it's, it's a great article. Uh, there's no doubt we have our work cut out for us. Um, who knows who MacGyver is? Raise your hand nice and tall. Everybody over the age of like 30, right? Oh, you youngins. Uh, well, do I need to go a little older? maybe 40. Oh, come on. I, I know who MacGyver is. Uh, we're short on time, so I'm not going to watch a MacGyver clip. Uh, but Cameron, what's MacGyver famous for? No, Doesn't matter. Pick a, pick a 20 year old. <laughs> what? Doing what? And duct tape. Yeah. The, the clip I have on here, I'm, I'm not going to show it to you, but, uh, uh, it's every episode. This is an old 80s show for the 20 year olds out there. And I know you've heard the term, just go MacGyver. Oh, look at you, MacGyver. We've all heard the phrase, right? Comes from the old show, uh, uh, MacGyver. And every episode's identical. People are trying to kill him or kill one of his friends or kill somebody that he's been hired to protect. And he has to disarm the bomb, save him, whatever. This episode that I was going to show, essentially, he disarms a bomb with silly putty. Um, and does it in a way so that the bomb backfires and kills the bad guys and he saves the day. So he MacGyver's it. I bring this up because we're all faced with uh, in, in, an absolute new market. Uh, call it going off a cliff, whatever you want to call the shift that happened last summer uh, was very real. And those of you that have been in the, the business quite a while will absolutely agree with me when talking about 2023, we have an entirely new business that we are, are facing. Do you agree? Get some head nods. Um, and in my opinion, there's a very real element of in order for us to survive and get deals done, we need to become MacGyver, right? So what does that mean to be MacGyver? Uh, I want to open up uh, a discussion. Uh, this isn't a Shoney or Johnny presentation where I'm going to stand up here the whole time and just give a boring lecture to have Travis keep yawning. Thank you, Travis. Uh, what I'd like to do is just open up a very, like, I just want to get real with you guys. There's some veterans in this room and we have a handful of lenders because the challenge of course is what, what messed up our whole market? Yeah. The lenders, just kidding. Just kidding. You guys we won't throw you under the bus. Uh, but we all know, we all know the challenge is, is absolutely, uh, caused by inflation, which trickled to the interest rate. And so we have a recession right now. Uh, that I would argue is a, is a man-made or better said, a Fed-made recession. Yeah, you can call me out on BS if you want to say you're wrong. You guys are welcome to. We're going to have a real discussion. So speak up now, guys. I want this two-way. Okay, so right now, I have John like Shoney are gone. about 50% of my transactions right now are a total shit show. Like they're insane, right? And I think most of them... <laughs> 
I think most of the time that they're in bad situations, it's because the other agent is doing everything in their power to try to show that they have value. Ooh. And it's like causing a problem. Like the transactions will still go smooth as long as you get out of the way and just do your job. Like do not cause problems. Like don't make it bigger deal than it needs to be. I feel like that's a lot of the problem. The other thing is too, is I feel like a lot of us are making it worse by thinking about it all the time. You think the market's bad when in reality, if you just go out there and make a few phone calls, there's still people out there that want to move. It's not as bad as you think it is. So should we just end the discussion right there? No, Amen. I just, I, I, I'm, I, as you were saying this, I was like, seriously, like I had this conversation with Brett Wild yesterday where agents are just causing the problem because they need a paycheck. Yeah, like, right. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just causing problems. We're getting in our own way right now. Yeah, I represent, you guys saw that listing, that Lion Home is a, a new construction listing agent. <clears throat> That's the name of the game, right? The buyer's agent come in and in an effort to create value, really just jam up the situation more than be helpful and say, this is new construction. Like it actually is fairly easy as long as we just do it right and keep it professional. Sometimes they get in their own way. Does this work okay? You guys can hear me? I'll talk loud. I just don't want to hold the mic the whole time. Um, thank you. So uh, you're absolutely right. Every, every transaction seems messy. Uh, uh, I said this in a team meeting a while ago, but if you guys remember the market we came from, I would call it the FOMO market, right? Everyone had a fear of missing out, right? So every buyer was just, I don't care what the details are. I just want to buy a home because it's a cool thing to do. It's cheaper than renting. Uh, uh, let's just do it. Just tell me where to sign, right? What kind of market do we have right now? The fear of making a mistake, whatever that, you, yeah, you, you can F figure out that. Yeah, FOB. Anyway, people are absolutely afraid of making a big mistake. And so the time it takes right now to walk a buyer or a seller for that matter through the transaction is what? Double, triple the amount of time, the amount of emails, uh, the amount of, of, of thought just in general in solving problems. This goes back to my theme of MacGyver, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good theme. So when I say I want to get real, uh, we have a fantastic group. There's got to be, we're, gosh, we're like 7,500 people right here. Can we just brainstorm out loud as a group on how to solve some problems? So I've got some scenarios here. I want to introduce you to some of my friends. The first friends we have here are a newlywed couple. We've got Pam and Jim. We've got Pam and Jim here. I'm going to get cords hung up here. You guys all see this okay? Pam and Jim just got married. Uh, as a part of their marriage, they received quite a bit of gifts. Uh, Jim's been a pretty frugal guy. Same with Pam. They've got great jobs. And uh, they've saved up $20,000. Okay? I wanted to introduce you to our next uh, uh, a seller. Uh, we've got Mike Scott here. Um, he needs to sell his home. He owes about $480,000 on his home. He's uh, got a 3.5% interest rate on that home. And uh, he thinks it's worth about seven fifty. dollars We all know it's more worth like maybe six, what? Yeah, maybe like six fifty dollars at best, right? So he's, uh, he's our good typical, uh, our typical seller. Who do we got next? I didn't even put these in order, so we'll see. Ah, Brother Shroot. <laughs> I'm going to try to spread these out a little more, you guys. I've just got like booby traps up here. Good thing I'm MacGyver to get around them. Um, okay, so we've got, we've got Investor Shroot. He's got $400,000 to invest. Okay. And last but not least, we've got our favorite, Kevin. Kevin's a buyer. Uh, Kevin actually just sold his condo to his sister. Um, they just did a little inside deal, whatever. Uh, oops, we're going to get in the middle here. Let's tighten these up. Uh, but he is a buyer with $200,000. How many, how many of you have clients right now that maybe loosely, but fit the description of one of the, I, I feel like I just covered like, it's got to be 80% of our clients, right? Who am I missing? Maybe like the investor that has like gazillions of dollars. Okay, I was gonna say I, I I thought about that, Colby, and I and uh, sorry, I just slipped your name. Uh, First Colony, what? Sorry, say again. TJ. TJ. Yeah, I'm sorry. So Utah Housing was the name of the game, right? So we might have that buyer that says, "Hey, I've got a thousand bucks to my name, 
Therefore, I need to do Utah housing. I have one of those under contract right now. It's just a joy. And I say that very sarcastically because it's, it's got its own challenges. We're not going to cover all of the details on that one, uh, but we've got good old first-time home buyers. So if we can, uh, is it the same market a year ago from now? Of course not. Uh, and so let's just start with our first-time home buyers. What's different? Like, just get real for a second. Why is it harder? Why did we go from FOMO to whatever the acronym we just created with fear of making a bad decision? What is it, Elizabeth? Yeah, and you're speaking from experience because we talked in Ignite uh, about your situation. So she just brings up a good point. If you guys didn't hear it, she says, well, the rent might not, the rent might not be very much money. This is one of the first times in my 16 year career uh, that clearly rent is now cheaper than buying. It's always been the opposite. It's always been a go-to to say, yo, Pam and Jim, like it's just cheaper to buy, period. From your monthly payment, it's cheaper to buy. Is that the case? They've got 20,000 in the bank. Is that the case? Not a chance. Okay, so that's the problem is monthly payment, monthly payment, monthly payment for our first time home buyers. So you guys, we're professional realtors, we're MacGyver. Um, think about people right now who you're working with. In fact, we even have some igniters that said, yeah, I've started to already have some conversation. They're friends that are like asking me, like, should I buy in this market? So who wants to tackle that? Should a first time home buyer buy a home in Utah? Who said yes? Why? And you don't have to give all the answers, but what's your favorite answer? Why should a first time home buyer pay more on a mortgage than rent? That's number one. And, and right now it's the time to buy because not everybody can afford to buy. And if you are able to buy, buy now because you're not going to wait until the interest rate drops and then the home homes go skyrocket in price again. You can change your interest rate later, but you cannot change the price of the home later. Okay, do you guys agree? Did you guys hear what she said? So now's the time to buy the dip, you know, as our crypto friends always like, maybe they're a bad example, but our stock market guys, buy the dip, right? There's absolutely, is there a dip right now? Home values are down how much across WFR? Uh, from, its, from its peak, from its peak, because it peaked. I think you're all right. I heard 10, 11, and 12. And here's the thing, when did, when did we peak? Right. It was like right at the beginning of Q2. I like to think in my mind, I, I had a meeting with Edge Home since we talked about them earlier. And I asked uh, Drew Dietrich, who's no longer there, but he was kind of running the sales department. And I said, Drew, when was the last time you did a price, read, uh, price increase on Edge product? And he said, I'll never forget. It was Friday, April 17th. I remember my office. I did the price increase and I've done nothing but price decreases since then. So in my mind, biggest builder, at least in North Utah County around us, like, okay, maybe it was that April 17th ish, you know, was kind of the last time we, we saw that increase. And so a good argument. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Buy the dip. We're 10, 11, maybe 12% lower in purchase price. Uh, what else? What, what else? Who wants to add to that? Why should a first time home buyer buy a home here in today's market? Right, so a rent payment does not equal a mortgage payment. And yet everyone hear what, why, why Matt said that? Say because a mortgage payment, unlike rent, has mortgage interest deduction, right? Which is a, a wonderful, wonderful tool, especially uh, if they're just married. They don't have their, what's their little kid's name? They don't have kids yet. They don't have that deduction. Mortgage interest is likely a newlywed couple, unless they're a, a vet or something. This is probably their greatest deduction on their taxes, right? What else, Cece, thank you. I knew there was an office guy in here too. Um, what else does a, a mortgage payment have that a rent payment doesn't have besides interest? You're paying principal, right? So a portion of this mortgage payment is going into the form of equity, right? So that's a good argument. What else? 
This is, a, this is an investment. This is an investment on behalf of your landlord. Just kidding. Yeah. Right? Taxes, the right? So now Brother Shroot just perked up. Brother Shroot just perked up, right? Uh, it, it, we can kind of jump, jump in between. Did everyone hear, hear what Matt just said? He said, well, real estate, regardless of it's literally appreciating or depreciating, you can in the eyes of the IRS, you can depreciate real estate. Uh, all the veterans are nodding their heads like, this is boring and all this. Newer agents, please, this is, this is the moment to have your tool in your MacGyver toolkit and to understand that whether it's a first time home buyer or an investor, you can depreciate uh, your real estate. Now, if they're occupying, can they? No. So what conversation might I have with Jim and Pam when they say, hey, yeah, we'd like to get into buying a house. Yeah, we know we can buy a dip. Yeah, our payment, that kind of makes sense. But really like our payment on the mortgage is more than rent. So like why else? This is probably where I would pivot. And I have pivoted a lot of my first time home buyers. And I've said, well, let's get real for a second. And can we actually think like an investor? Is there not an ability to go buy a property that has potential for a basement ADU? a basement apartment or a roommate situation? And can you get tax deductions and depreciate the ADU in a single family home? Yes. And if you don't know that, write that down. That's important. You can absolutely have your accountant carve out that 30, 40, 50% of that single family home that you're occupying, and they can do a depreciation schedule on the ADU. Now, that might be really boring to them until I say that depreciation schedule can put thousands of dollars per year in your pocket. Now, all of a sudden, they say, maybe I should pay attention to taxes. I've never had to worry about taxes. Maybe I should. The FOMO buyers that we had a year and a half ago, you never talked about taxes, right? Now we should be. There's opportunity there. Okay? So they've, we've convinced them. Jim and Pam, they want to buy this house. Maybe it's a single family with a mother-in-law apartment. Great, but we've only got 20 grand, and we really want to fight the rate right? Lenders, we want to battle you. What are the tools? How do we get around the nasty rate? 2-1 buy, buy, buy down, right out the gates. Temporary buy down are better right now. Why? Temporary buy down, the money that you put into it never... On a temporary buy down, the money that you put into it belongs to the buyer. So it sits with the lender. If they were to refinance, which of course we're all hoping for in the next three years, then that money goes towards their principal. On a permanent buy down, it doesn't make that much difference in the interest rate. And all of that money is lost and gone forever. When they refinance two years from now, they don't have that money. Jordan, do you have any idea what she's talking about right now? Barely. Barely. Do you guys understand? We've talked about it a few times, but a two-one buy down is what? Do you want just to find it real quick? What is a two? I've got Jim and Pam here. They're like a what and a who and the interest rate. Just real quick, what is a two-one buy down? So if the interest rate today is six and a half, the first year they make a payment as if the interest rate is two and a half. I mean, sorry. Two points less. Uh, four and a half. The next year they make the payment as if it's five and a half. But in reality, the lender has the investor has the money the lender and is just supplementing their monthly payment. It gives people a chance to kind of get a runway into their full payment, which they have to qualify on anyway. Does that help? Yeah. So Jordan, what they're saying is, is, Hey, your payment, just a normal payment, you're going to pay six and whatever percent today. Uh, you know, for their little home, they found a little single family home. Um, in fact, I'll give you, I'm doing a two, one buy down right now. Edge home, ironically, listed for six six eleven. What do you think I have it under contract for? Five sixty five. Right? They they got three hundred spec homes. They will wheel and deal. Right? So five sixty five. They've got about twenty five grand in there. And I said, okay, let's talk two one buy down. They say, well, what is that? I said, well, your monthly payment right now, straight up, with only I'm there five percent down. Essentially, is where we're at. We're five percent down. Uh, their monthly payment is almost four thousand dollars on five sixty five. First time home buyers, four, four grand. And like, well, I can't afford that. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I don't blame you. I, that's insane, right? Um, $4,000. But we talked about, well, I still want a house. There's still all of these reasons, but there's also the reason that none of us talked about, which is home ownership still has a very intrinsic value of just, I'm not a renter, I'm an owner, and I might just own something great. And there's value in that. And he, and he very much, I say he, it's a husband and wife. They fit in that very, very much. And they said, well, 
we want the home and we and they do want to do an apartment down in the unfinished basement edge got a nice little setup they could easily add it down the road but they said I, there's no way we can afford uh nearly four thousand dollar payment so we talk about the two one buy down where the seller has to contribute the the, the money in order to essentially prepay the interest so that they can have a lower payment and grow into it so his first payment's only about thirty two hundred dollars is where we landed and that's payment he says i can handle that this just means I've got to make a shift before that third year comes around. I, we're, we're praying for the, the interest rate gods to, to really shine their light on, on that, what not. What else, what other tools does a first time home buyer have that you as an agent can help them with? Two one buy down, maybe just a normal rate buy down, what else? With 20 grand, not a chance, please. Yeah, Melanie asked, what about ARMS, ARMs, adjustable rate mortgages? Are they out there? Yes. Are they better? I'll let you guys answer. What do you think? Would you promote, if I brought in Jim and Pam to you, would you say, yeah, let's. The let's FHA get them into ARMS arms. specifically too. I would show them a two one item. I have to show. Sorry. I, I would show them the options. An ARM is going to give you a lower rate, but that rate over time could adjust and go up. If you don't refinance out of it, a two on buy down can give you a lower upfront payment in anticipation of maybe getting a refinance down the road as well. So I, I, I just like to educate them. The arm doesn't cost money up front. That is a true statement. Yes. Right. But in most circumstances right now, we're seeing sellers are willing to contribute to help get their home sold. Bingo. And so we can utilize those funds from sellers to the benefit of the buyer. Has anybody closed a buyer in the last 30 days that did not get a very handsome seller concession? You'll, I'd love to know the details. I mean, right now, every builder, every seller, hopefully they're being prepped to get their, get their uh, concession in place, right? So first time home buyers, little tricky, but they've got this, yeah? Please, because this is our time. Take notes. Okay, so I just tools. did this actually right before Christmas, but um, if it's a like edge or if it's one of the builders, um, I got them to do a nicer fridge, not even just the like, you know, side by side, but like a nice fridge, washer dryer, get some other things put in because that's out of pocket costs mm. for your first time home buyer that's going to grand. preserve their 20 grand if they need it for payments later. So when you actually look at, I basically got them $5,000 worth of items. Um, and so, and then the builder can write that off in a different way. So uh, basically like when you look at the preserving of their cash, because that's, what's giving them anxiety, you know, is okay. Am I going to be able to make this payment? Um, but to show them actually that amount of money also helps them greatly. Awesome. So increase the price. If you have to do everything you can to protect that. The last one that nobody's said, maybe you're going to say it. We've only got 20 grand. Good. All right, move them to Gunnison. Great. Here, we're Janella. getting you're, you're beating my segue. We're going to seller financing. I promise you guys. We're going there right after this. Yeah, Great. An assumable loan. But if the assumable loan, again, if we go back to Mr. Seller and there's a gap that big, if they want to assume that loan, they have to bridge the gap. Can they bridge a gap on an assumable loan of 20? Probably not. It's our first time home buyer. Yeah. Perfect question. What? Yeah, no, this is critical because my guy panicked when I he said, well, I don't want to waste. We just negotiated a full 3% out of edge. That's a lot of money. I don't want to lose the 3% on a 2-1 buy down. But the answer is that prepaid interest, if they refi early, ends up in whose pocket ultimately? The buyers. Their principal balance when they refinance. Bingo. It goes straight to principal. Yep. Yeah. And, that, and I hope everybody write that down because that was, that's like the number one, like, oh, but you just got me 3%. Yada, yada. Yes. I had an agent tell me, why would you ever do a 2 1 buy down? Rates will come down before your three year mark and you're going to refine. You're just going to blow all the money. I said, you're, you're wrong. And I just learned this last month. I, I, I wasn't sure if they were. <laughs> Yeah. 
frame things in a way so they look like they know. Colby's on a soapbox right now uh, on uh, crappy agents. And I'll tell you what, that this is a good time. Let's let's talk about our other three people uh, with, uh, well, the seller's a seller, but let's talk about the people with money and, and let's bring in the, the seller financing conversation because this is the play, this is the the plague that, you're discussing is uh, agents that think they know it all and they don't. And there's never been a, a bigger issue than around the seller financing conversation. Uh, I did board tour, a uh, little home tour, which I never do. Uh, just just uh, last week, we had some homes here in North County and I, we went to a little condo, $399.9, uh, built there in American Fork by, uh, what do they call that, Rockwell or whatever. And she stood there, it was like perfect, mint condition, top floor unit, beautiful. Uh, I'd only been in the market a couple of days. And there's like 20 agents came to this and, the, and we always do feedback, right? What feedback would you give the seller? And people are like, oh, well, you could like dust that little corner right there. And I'm like, really? And finally, I just said, you know, why aren't you offering seller financing? Um, and, and, and I said, you know, if you had seller financing, you'd probably increase your price 20 grand. This agent's been in the business a long time. Her, her hair was, was about as gray as Dean's. Uh, just kidding. White, white. There you go. We always pick on, on, on his sexy hair. Uh, but uh, this agent has been in the business a very long time. You, a lot of you probably know her. She's, she's well-respected. And she said, I never even thought of that. How does seller financing work again? I said, boy, you're, you're like, you should, you should know this. I don't want anybody hearing my voice right now to leave this room saying that, saying, I don't understand seller financing. And so let's segue to that. You've got a buyer here. He's got 200 grand in the bank, but he's facing the same issues as the first time home buyer of my payments really high, uh, you know, but I still want to take advantage of the dip, but that darn stinking interest rate. What does he have the ability, or we can kind of, we can kind of group uh, Dwight into it. He's got 400 grand to invest. What might these two be able to do? Cut the lender out. I see that kind of tongue in cheek. I love you guys. But seller financing is the ability to say, hey, temporarily, we'll come back to you guys later when your rates get better. But temporarily, can we not negotiate a seller financing deal? So what is seller financing? That is when a seller simply carries a mortgage note. There's still a transaction. They sell the home. You have a closing. But they move into a, a, a mortgage position. And they hold a note. And they say, OK. Michael's going to say to Kevin, you've got 200 grand. I want 750. That's more than enough to put down a 20% down payment. And I'll carry the rest and finance it at perhaps a 4.5% rate. Can you even buy the rate down to 4.5% right now without spending a gazillion dollars? No. I don't think you can, right? It's just too far. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a seller that's offering uh, a 4.5% rate a buyer, a line of buyers that want to take advantage of that four and a half rate uh, to do it. Uh, so why should they do it? And why should they not do it? Let's talk about buyer first. Obviously they want it because they want the rate. Great. Done. That's really, really simple. Why would a seller want to consider seller financing? Matt. Okay, so he's going to offer seller financing, and Matt just said, well, one of the perks are you get uh, essentially more income because he's getting income off of the seller financed payments. How much income? Could be somewhat significant, right? Because he's only at a 3.5% rate. He's going to offer a 4.5% rate, so there's some margin there. Also, he only owes 480. 20% taken off of 750 is what, six or 590, whatever that you guys do the math on it. That's a good $100,000 more than that. So there's enough margin that the monthly payment, and I want everyone to hear this because I just did the math this morning for one of my clients that we are, we are offering seller financing. And uh, the monthly payment from the buyer to him is a full $2,000 more than his mortgage. So he's going to profit 
$2,000 a month by offering seller financing. And he said, Clay, why, why, why aren't, like, why would you ever tell me to go buy a rental property? Because we were going to sell the property and go buy a rental property. And he said, why would I go buy a rental property over doing a seller financing deal? And I could not answer that question. I said, there's no chance you're going to cash flow. It's a terrible time to be an investor in Utah, frankly, because the interest rate on an investor is 7% or more, right? He said, well, I'm going to make $2,000. This will be the best rental property scenario, the best income imaginable, right? So when you say, yeah, he's going to make more money, uh, you're absolutely right. And, and, this, and this, these numbers right here are probably closer to like $1,200 a month profit if, if I were to throw that in the calculator. So $1,200 a month. I, I expect hands, yeah. So glad you asked. So what does every loan, thank you. Every loan has a do on sell clause. So this is something I learned recently. Um, why? Because there's tons of seller financing happening. And there's tons of seller financing happening when sellers still have a loan with a do on sell clause. How is this possible? Anyone want to answer that? Why is the do not sell clause being triggered? Yes. So you can't change the title. It has to stay on the sellers, under the seller's name on an FHA loan. But when, with the title company, when you change the title and if you continue to make your payments, it's not going to trigger. I, I, it will, you know, it could, but it's not, it, it usually doesn't trigger the, the do on sale. Well, this is right, but boy, I'm a seller. I'm a very conservative. I really am a, this is such a terrible example for this, but uh, I'm very, I pay, I'm a letter of the law follower. Um, if there's even a, a, a slight chance that they could call the loan due by doing seller financing, I don't want to do it. So is there a maybe? Yeah. You guys sure about that? Because I've always said that too. Until I had Jax Petty, who, who's taught a lot about seller financing, say, has anyone read the do on sell clause? If you read the do on sell clause, they have to either not receive payment or they have to not take payment. If they want to trigger the do on sell clause, the bank has to fundamentally reject the payment. Has a bank or will a bank is that even possible nowadays in the days of technology with an auto pay uh, system set up on your account for them to not take your payment? If the payment hits the bank's account, they cannot exercise the do on sell clause. Now, you guys fact check me, but that's literally what, mo that's what, that's what we read in that paragraph. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, again, if you start missing payments, sure, they're going to say, we're not getting payments and you're not even on title anymore. Yeah, do on sale, think, and they're going to call it. Yeah. So, I feel like we can't talk about seller financing. Without we're talking about it well, and we're almost out of time. What, yeah, my biggest right thing about seller financing is you can't talk about all the benefits of a seller financing deal and not even, like, what's the risk that's involved? There's always like a, a certain amount of risk with the reward that you're getting in return for that kind of, like, that kind of a deal. So what's the risk? I haven't done a seller financing deal ever. Yeah, we've done like 12 of them as Red Sign Team in the last 60 days. This is our bread and butter right now is seller financing. That's why Shoney said you got to touch on creative financing. And we're we're doing a lot, we're doing we're doing these for a couple of primary reasons. And I'll and then I'll answer your question. And I know we've got to wrap up. Uh, number one, uh, the, yes you're going to make more income like Matt said, but what else are you going to do like 99% of the time when you offer seller financing, what do you get? You get your list price. Is there an appraisal? No. Are there even closing costs when you do seller financing for the buyer? Nope. What title work though? You might not, you might not, why, why do a lender's policy? You don't have to, it's your choice. So they have a closing fee of about $500. So there's no closing cost, no concession, no seller here paying 3% and they're getting full price. So right out the gates, just by offering seller financing, they get another 30, 40 grand here. They do this for three, five, 10 years, another hundred grand in income here. Why? So now to your question, this is too good to be true for a seller to offer seller financing. But the naysayers will say, well, it's risky. 
So what's risky about seller financing? The buyers are not necessarily technically pre-approved possibly. Sure. Yeah, do we the care if they're default? Do we, yeah, so the number one fear is, well, what if they stop making payments? Yeah. Or, or, or worse, what if they're not qualified? What if they're the most crappy buyers in the world, their credit's in, in, the, in the toilet? W what then? Or close. You guys have so many hands up, and, and I'm going to answer it all for you. And that is, I would pray, and I would hope, Mr. Seller, that you would have the opportunity to win the lottery of your buyer not making a payment. Why? Yeah. Because you get the house back and you keep their money. So this is totally a function of how much down payment. Now, when uh, Matt was saying, well, out in Gunnison, I can get these guys into a seller finance with $8,000 down. Sure, but is a buyer willing to walk away from $8,000? Yeah, are they gonna walk away from $200,000? Not a chance. Kevin gets in a pinch. He's about to miss payments to Michael. What's he gonna do? He's gonna sell, sell the house. dang house. He's gonna refinance. He's gonna call mom and dad. He's not going to lose his 200 grand. And if he does, congratulations, Michael, you just won the lottery. So on my seller financing deal, did I even pull credit? I could care less. I could care less. You give me $200,000 and commit to a seller financing deal, we'll take it all day long. And if you can't refinance in five years from now, goody, not my problem. I'll take your money and the house. So many hands. Go fast. Good question. So does he qualify to go buy a house? Yes, I'm going to say does. just so fast. Yes, 100%. Why? Yes, he does. Because guess what I'm going to give you? When he goes to get a loan from you, I'm going to give you documented income from the seller financing deal to wash it down. If you say, oh, my underwriters don't understand seller financing, whatever, well, guess what I'm going to give you? A lease. I'm going to give you a lease that illustrates the seller financing arrangement here. It's not a lease, though. For I'm going to illustrate year, yes. it. I, I'm going to illustrate it as a lease because I'm going to put this on a contract for deed. If it's within the first year, you'll hit the whole 75% of the income uh, can count, and, and we might have to navigate that a little bit. But certainly after a year, it's income. I'm going to claim it. Yeah, and you also have 200,000. He just did this. Yeah, we just we just close we just close one. So essentially, you start with the lease option to buy. And you're capturing their down payment in that lease option to buy, which then will help them qualify for that new home. Once they once they qualify, close that loan on their new home, that lease option then transforms into a contract for deed or all-inclusive seller financing note. So it is, is how that it works. We close your loan and so then we just the yeah we just did one. Or so if they're not going to buy originally out the gates, if you're not going to have that transition, you have to. The seller has to have 12 months of payments from the escrow company to be able to then take that to offset that mortgage that they have on the, the, the home they just sell or financed. I don't see why not. Um, yeah, as fast as you can get a PR, you can do it. You should. <laughs> no, hey, you joke, you joke. Investors, you own a rental, you own rentals right now. Again, you could make more money on the rental uh, right now, uh, or excuse me, more money on the seller financing than the rental if the market is truly, which it is, it is, de it is depreciating. And Utah, here's the hard thing. And I, guys, we're like way over time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's, so yeah, pick up the phone. Let's sell some house. I mean, this is, this, is, this is why we're having this conversation is these should be the easiest conversations in the world. And when you've got you know, investors with money, they're like, ah, do I want to invest in Utah? It sucks in Utah. Can you, can you get a cash flowing property with even 20% down right now? No. What about 25%? No. 30%? Ah, we can break even. Yuck. Like Utah's a rough place because of the dang interest rate, right? And if it's like, well, I'm just going to pay cash for a property. Is that a good idea? Market's doing this, probably wouldn't do that either. So where do you stick your cash? It's a very hard conversation. But if you've got these investors with cash and you can find sellers that offer the seller financing, it's absolutely a win for these buyers because they can get the rate that makes their wills turn. If an investor can get a four and a half percent, I'm one of them. I bought a townhome at the peak earlier in 2022. Terrible time to buy in terms of price, but do I lose sleep? No, because I'm at four and a half percent. I've got my renter. I have a long-term perspective. It's a great investment. This buyer, that investor, same philosophy. Hey, if I'm at four and a half, my numbers look great. If I'm at seven, I, I, I'm not buying in Utah. Because we were way over time. But you're asking questions, so I'll keep going. Yes.
what, the what, what? what about the interest rate between the seller financing and the mortgage? I think was our question. It's like, profit to the seller. So if he's at three and a half, but we're offering four and a half to him, all profit to the seller. Yeah. Hey, just to let everyone know, on the 31st of this month, we do have Jack's Petty coming in 14. Canceled. Did he cancel? Okay, good. Sorry, keep going. He didn't. He, he didn't? didn't? No. Well, that's what we have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. no. Okay, good. Taylor? Jack Petty is coming in on the 31st. That's a Tuesday team meeting, and he'll be going all over seller financing like he did for Red Sign. So if you have a lot of questions, you can definitely come to yeah. that and yeah. get those answered. Yeah, she's worried about the contract. I promise you guys, it's by the book. They have deed. They have title. It's an all-inclusive deed. That way it protects his mortgage that he's got here and, wrap, and, and wraps it in. It, this is all done by the book. Yeah. I was just going to say, I just did one. Yeah, I just did one too. And I asked the title guy, who's an attorney, but he'd only had one D1 sale call in. And what it was is a house burnt down with a fire. Mm. When the insurance company wrote the check, Wrote to the wrong person. Yeah. Well, and, bi and big asterisk the one loan that you really can't do a seller financing on because they actually police the do on sale is Utah Housing. You have to have Utah Housing's permission because they randomly or systematically do check title. Utah Housing will not bless this unless you talk to them about it. Um, I'll end real quick. Where's Marcos at? Is Marcos in the room? He's in the back. He's in the back talking to somebody. Oh, there you are. Sorry, dude. A lot of people here. I'll just share your story real quick because we're way over time. Uh, Marcos had his first deal last month as well, seller financing. And he represented a seller. The seller came to him because I went on that appointment. And he said, you're not going to believe this, but my condo in Salt Lake burnt down. I haven't lived in it for 18 months. It literally burnt down. And he said, my insurance doesn't cover the monthly payment. So for 18 months, he's been making a payment on a condo that ultimately doesn't exist. His still kind of existed because he's the bottom floor, but it filled up with water from the fire hoses. And he said, I'm just simply at a point. I am out of money. I only owe 240. CMAs on the condos around the corner that are existing were over 300 but he didn't, have, he didn't even have an occupiable unit. And he said, what in the world do I do? What do I get? Now, the pre-2023 clay or the pre-MacGyver clay would have been quick to say, well, we'll list it at like simply the lowest possible price you can. Maybe there's an investor that will say, well, I'll take that property for that low price, even though I can't stick renters in it and generate income uh, for potentially 18 months to two years before it's finally rebuilt. And, uh, and, and he, of course, that was kind of what, where the seller's mind is. I just want to get out of it, but I don't want to lose it. And, and then, of course, he said, well, if I could just make like 3000 bucks, you'd make all my dreams come true. How much money did he get in his pocket? $17,000. How did we sell a burnt down condo and get $17,000 in this guy's pocket? We offered seller financing and we only took $20,000 down. And we found an investor that said, absolutely, I'm getting it for a great price, but more importantly, I'm getting it for great financing. I will make that seller financing payment for the next 18 months until I can get the income coming in and it work. And we had multiple offers on it. That's the power of seller financing in even funky, weird situations. Yes, really fast, because then we got to introduce a lunch sponsor. Yes, you come to, to that class on the 31st, because when I did my seller financing deal last week, or the end of last week, uh, last month, Jack Perry was, uh, they were, we both real estate agents knew the Jack. And I told, I told the other real estate agent, I, I have a buyer, can we do seller financing? I, say, he, I said, we're working with Jack. And he says, let's do it. Come, because once you, Jack is really, really knows seller financing. He really, really knows. And, and, and that's how your deals will come through. If the other agent knows that you're working with Jack uh, and you know what, how, how these deals are done, it will come through. Yep. He, he helped rewrite the new seller financing addendum on the MLS, but he's still not happy with it. It's really funny to get him on a soapbox. You guys, uh, okay, so quick. These guys are going to murder me. Shoney's well, never going to let me do a teaming again. Sorry, like I'm just wondering 12, what the commission for like a seller financing, is it at the initial time or 
when the contract is completed. Ooh, and great the, question. Because I know it's a little bit like it has to be t- determined to every deal, right? No, oh. it's very black and white. When you do seller financing, is there a real estate transaction? Yes. Yes, at the beginning. Money changes hands. You go to a title company. There's a HUD settlement statement. Uh, they close it. The seller's going to pay your commission right out of his down payment to him. So his net to his pocket won't be the full 200 because he's got some expenses to do this. If you ask me, I think a listing that does seller financing should be three and a half, four percent on the listing side, uh, even though it can close in three days. But it's great, right? Because they're not paying concessions. They're not paying all these things. Different on a lease option though. Yeah, right. you're thinking lease option, that, that transaction isn't until the end. You, you get paid when title transfers hands. I asked Johnny about you, that. You can, you can structure it so there's their commission so, paid in the front and in the refi yeah. period as well. So we've got a listing in Grantsville right now where the numbers are really tight because he purchased at the peak. And so we have part of the commissions being paid out with the down payment and part of them with the refi because things are so tight. So... Okay, then the last comment, of course, is Dwight says, I don't like any of this. I really like St. George, like cool rental properties. I really want to have like a Huntington Beach uh, vacation property. I want to do like the the nightly rental scene, Uh, but I don't want to own just like a million dollar home. I want to own like an $8 million home on the shores of Tahoe. Can you get me? Can you get me into a, a short-term rental situation with only 400 grand down? And the answer is yes, bring in Ember Homes, right? <laughs> what a segue. Yeah, so Ember's got lunch for us. Uh, now, when I say us, uh, I'm just gonna get real candid. If you guys are gonna stay to hear Jake and Heather talk about how Ember Homes is doing uh, uh, fractional ownership of, of these big fancy homes, if you're going to stay for that, eat a lunch. If you're not going to stay for that, Taco Bell's down the street because I don't think there's enough lunches for We have a huge turnout today. So just be, be sensitive to that. And yeah, be grab your lunch and stay. Grab your lunch and stay. Heather. Uh, we're starting right now. So just stick We're around. starting right now. So grab a lunch yeah, quick. And this over. is going to be about 30 minutes, high power energy. It's going to be awesome. So we're excited about it. You want this? It's gonna Take suck. a five minute break real quick. Yeah, I was. That was a whole lot set up. I mean, like, Dave's like, crazy. My basement flooded, and I've had the. Yeah. Was I the one? What? Did you say something in the fridge? Somebody else should.